Thank you. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here, a great honor as well. Uh, I want to congratulate the uh, organizers and the managers of this amazing uh, project. Uh, and thank you all for attending this uh, meeting uh, uh, tonight. Uh, it's a very depressing topic, as you may imagine. What are the chances for peace uh, in Israel and Palestine? Uh, it is even more depressing if you remember, if I remember correctly, that I have been giving talks under this title in the last 40 years, which means the chances have not improved, probably. Otherwise, there would be a different title to this talk. But I think it is important. It is very, very important to discuss uh, Palestine and the future of Palestine, uh, especially in a moment where, due to uh, the uh, developments around Palestine, especially in Syria and Iraq, there is a tendency to push the issue of Palestine to the margins of uh, public attention, uh, which also reflects the, the lack of interest among uh, politicians and uh, diplomats in the future of Palestine, whereas uh, 10 years ago you could have said it was still a very important uh, topic. Uh, very high on the agenda of uh, policy makers, of major uh, actors in the international uh, arena. Uh, today it is less, becomes less and less crucial in their eyes uh, to do anything about Palestine. And it seems that also the uh, traditional triggers that used to attract international attention to the need to help and solve the question of Palestine, such as an uprising uh, or uh, uh, a deterioration in the conditions uh, uh, of living uh, of the Palestinians, it seems that these triggers do not work anymore because everything is compared to what's happening in Syria. Uh, and you cannot really win in this comparison. Uh, the, the level of destruction in Syria, which of course includes also the destruction of Palestinian life there, uh, is such that it's very difficult to um, uh, insist that first the Palestine issue is strongly connected to the events in Syria and even to peace in Syria, and secondly that the atrocities in Palestine have not started three or four years ago but have been going on for a century and therefore uh, they may not seem always as dramatic and as cruel and brutal as they do seem today in uh, Syria. Uh, uh, the world still needs to remember what happened in Palestine, what goes on in Palestine, and should definitely not forsake uh, the Palestinians and their homeland. So it's obvious that the, the first answer to the question of the chances of peace is connected to uh, developments outside of Palestine. It is quite logical to say that uh, if there will be any positive movement uh, in Syria and in a certain, in a certain respect also in Iraq, then uh, the world attention would be redirected uh, hopefully, to Palestine once more, and that always gives a, a better chance. But uh, this is, I think, only one trigger that can enhance the chances of peace and reconciliation. And I don't think it is the most important one, uh, because uh, uh, whatever happens in Syria, uh, uh, I think that the events in Palestine have their own momentum and their own relevance to the future of the Middle East as a whole, and maybe even to the future of the relationship between the Arab and Muslim world and the rest of the world, no less than the events in Syria. And I think that's why uh, we are able as human beings, as activists, as politicians and journalists who are involved in these issues, I think we're able to, to work parallel on parallel lines here with, or with more than one uh, case of injustice 
that calls uh, uh, on our uh, consciousness or our attention. And uh, there are more important elements which are missing, I think, and I would like to highlight them tonight, uh, which for me are the main obstacle for peace. And uh, they are not all related to the kind of usual uh, suspects, if you want. Uh, most people would say, well, you need to see a change in American policy if you want to see any chance for reconciliation in Israel and Palestine. Uh, other people would say you need uh, the Palestinian issue of unity to be resolved. You need a more united Palestinian front. You need a more authentic Palestinian representation uh, in order to move or to enhance the chances of peace. And I think both issues are uh, 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 correct, both the issue of uh, uh, American policy and the need for Palestinian unity. But I think there are even deeper concerns that are, should really interest us when uh, we are analyzing the chances for peace in Israel and Palestine. And they are not less relevant than American policy or Palestinian unity, which again, I want to stress, I'm not underestimating the importance of these two uh, elements. And the, uh, what I mean by that is, the, is really the role that Europe needs to play, and Britain maybe in particular needs to play in the story uh, of Palestine, both as a historical narrative, as a current problem, and as a future vision. If you uh, look at the way the issue of Palestine is engaged with in Western universities, for instance, or how European and British media uh, frame the question of Palestine. Or if you listen to the BBC or view the BBC whenever it uh, does its uh, utmost uh, to relate to Palestine in a deeper way, namely not just as an item of news, but through documentaries, in-depth uh, analyses, and so on, there is one striking feature that I think is an obstacle for peace in that kind of a treatment. And I'm just talking about the BBC as a symptom of a much wider phenomenon, which reflects the way politicians in Europe frame the issue in Palestine, the way the media in general does, and the academia and other cultural uh, uh, spaces uh, or agencies when they deal with, with Palestine. And what is striking is the inability of all those who have a say uh, in their local societies or have an impact in the local society or potential impact in their local societies about the future of Palestine is their inability to define Zionism the ideology behind the Jewish state as colonialism. As if this is the worst thing you can say about uh, an ideology of a state. There are so many societies around the world that uh, have come to terms with their colonialist past, either as colonizers or as colonized. There are so many societies who understand that their colonialist past, and again, depends which role they played in it, is uh, a, a very good ex explanation for their predicament uh, in the present. Uh, some deal with it successfully, some deal with it less successfully, but rarely does any one of these societies who was within the colonialist condition, rarely do they uh, uh, deny the fact that they were part of a colonialist reality. Uh, Zionism was such a clear case study of settler colonialism, that it must have been an amazing Israeli success to convince Western academia, Western media, Western political system to totally ignore that fact. There isn't one course in a university or a module in the West on colonialism that uses Zionism as a case study. 
There isn't one encyclopedia in the world that under the entry of colonialism would mention Zionism. This is such a fabrication of history that if you understand its power, you will understand also why it is so significant, no less than American policy and no less than the lack of unity on the Palestinian side. This is highly important. The fact that the colonialist project was able to present itself as something which was exactly the opposite, uh, as actually a victim of colonization, rather than the colonial power itself, explains a lot of the exceptionalism, the immunity that it won throughout the years for its project in Palestine. And the peace process had totally ignored this historical fact. And by ignoring the historical fact, it allowed the colonization to deepen, to go further, to such an extent that, of course, it's even more difficult to decolonize Palestine today than it was 50 years ago or 70 years ago. I can't think of another peace process in the world which had no relevance whatsoever to the problem as the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. So many people owe their careers to this process, including uh, the illustrious Tony Blair. <laughs> so, many, um, so many academics have reached the highest possible echelons in British academia because of the peace process. So many publishers made money out of books written uh, on, on the peace process. And so many hopes were shattered by this peace process. It is not surprising that when you visit Palestinians, wherever they are, whether it's inside Israel, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and refugee camps, they are the only group in the world that will tell you that whenever there was a peace process, life became worse. Life after the United Nations petition plan for Palestinians was much worse than it was a year before. Life after the Oslo process was far worse for Palestinians than it was a year before. There isn't such a place in the world where the peace process deteriorates the life of the people supposedly who should benefit from this process. And the reason, I come back to my point, the reason that this is happening is not because bad people are involved in the peace process. And not because everybody who is part of the peace process has bad intentions or cynical interests. Of course, some do. But quite a lot of good people were involved in the peace process throughout the years. But because the framing of the conflict was wrong, it ignored the main issue at hand, it became a waste of energy, of effort, but far worse, it became a tool in the hand of the settler colonial society to continue successfully the project of the colonization of Palestine and the dispossession of its people. So when people say the Oslo Accord was a failure, I disagree with them. From an Israeli point of view, the Oslo Accord was a huge success. It fragmented the Palestinian further. It... Uh, convinced Europe to finance the Israeli occupation, which was very costly before Oslo. And it provided Israel another 30 years of immunity from any international condemnation. So from an Israeli perspective, it was a great success. From a Palestinian perspective, it was a disaster which is no less significant than the disaster of 1948. But unless, unlike 1948, their own leadership signed that disaster themselves. And that's a big difference between the two points of disaster. <laughs>